<laughs> Dude, never did it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Hello, yeah. everybody. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Yeah, it was good. I, I liked what, it. I don't know what depths of my soul I drew that from. Uh, <laughs> Keep going. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a very special edition of the Never Did It podcast. My name is Jake Ziegler. I'm here with my co-host and best bud, Brad Garoon. We uh, today are going to be taking a special deep dive into the films of the director, David Fincher. We're going to be uh, ranking all of his uh, feature films and talking about why we ranked them that way. Why don't we dive right in and start with our number 12. Uh, Brad, what do you have at number 12? So I want to guess that we have the same number 12. I'm not positive because I know you don't like Fight Club, but I'm going to guess that we both have the curious case of Benjamin Button at number 12. We do not. Damn. So you have Fight Club at number 12. I do have Fight Club at number 12. Okay, so we'll talk about Fight Club in a minute. But first, let's talk about the curious case of Benjamin Button, because what happened here? So, okay, here's my my overall take on Fincher's more, I don't want to say cloying, although I did find this movie cloying, but his more accessible movies. Uh, accessible you know, would be a good, yeah, that would probably yeah. be good for it. Uh, they seem to all revolve around his relationship with his dad. And by all, I mean two, because he's only made two. And they are this and Mank. And I think that this one fails and Mank succeeds. So he made this movie after his dad died, I think, you know, to to sort of get at his feelings about death. And there's a lot here that you could mine for interesting things about interesting ideas about death. But what they forgot to do or deliberately didn't do was give their main character a personality. And they have this great charismatic actor at the center of this, Brad Pitt, playing a guy who is seven years old, but looks a lot older. And that's the that's it. That's all you're going to get from this guy. So that's it. it's a good, it's good makeup and good visual effects. And that's that's about it. That's what he's got. I don't have it as my number 12, but I do have it ranked pretty low. So I'm I'm with you on this. I'd say it's good makeup and okay visual effects. So Fincher, Fincher has been working with VFX and digital filmmaking for a long time now, and he does it better than many. But a lot of this stuff has started to look dated. Like a lot of the stuff that looked really cool when Fight Club first came out or when Panic Room first came out now looks like it was made by a computer. And old Brad Pitt looks like it was made by a computer too. Kate Blanchett is great, but... Uh, There's just so right. Duh. That's yeah, not right. that's, <laughs> that's not news. <laughs> but I have a hard time buying that she's so in love with this guy who has nothing to say to her. They have no reason to be in love. They don't show us any reason. What was the idea you think? Was it I want to make this guy an avatar for anyone who can who can, wants to put themselves in his position? Yeah, I think it was an everyman sort of thing. I mean, I I, I know I've shown you that joke trailer that it's like where it equates Benjamin Button to Forrest Gump. Because it follows the same story beats and was written by the same writer. But I think that's what I think they're going for, like an everyman sort of thing. And I think maybe they're just relying on his condition to be the selling point rather than, you know, giving him a personality or anything, uh, you know, anything else that's interesting about him. And yeah, before Scump had a personality, I mean, his his he funny, his, he was funny and his limitations weren't emotional. They were <laughs> they were intellectual. Mm hmm. And Benjamin Button is so quiet that you start to wonder if he has intellectual <laughs> disabilities. He's just a blank it, slate. I, yeah, it, it didn't work for me. No. And it drags on forever. And some of the people that come in and out of his life, this is the thing about having a main character without a personality in a movie as sprawling as this. Why do you have people come in and out of his life if he's going to be the same before and after he meets them? Forrest Gump takes something from everybody he meets. Yep. I uh, And I don't even think Forrest Gump is that great. Oh, I, I like Forrest Gump, but yeah, it's not like a not brilliant or compared, you know, compared to this, it's The Godfather. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. I, I was really flabbergasted. I watched the, I watched this on two train rides, and I am in such a good mood when I'm on a train, and this didn't benefit from that. Anyway, that's how I feel about Benjamin Button. At thir at, uh, for me, it's thirteen because I do want to talk about one other thing. But as far as features go, it's that's my number twelve. Mm -hmm. All right, so your number twelve is Fight Club. We can get right into it because I know we don't agree. Yeah, I just I I don't like it. I I, I never liked it, uh, and and I was kind of hopeful when when I watched it this time around, um, or I watched it a couple years ago, like two years ago, with my friend Jeff Richardson, a friend of the show, and uh, uh, I was like thinking, to me, like you know, maybe this time, you know, maybe I was just hard on it back then because I know there are certain things I've changed my mind on. Where like there was a period of time where I think I was you know just like really really into Roger Ebert and you know like kind of maybe listened to him a little too closely, and or I was just maybe you know too up my own butt about certain things. I was like, all right, you know, I like Fincher. I'm a little bit older now. Maybe I'll 
maybe I'll get this movie a little more. I'm like, no, I still don't like it. I think it's really pretentious. I think it's really obnoxious. I think the second half of the movie, or I think the first half of the movie promises something the second half doesn't really deliver. Which is um, what? Well, I think the first half of the movie is like, oh, you're going to, you know, you're going to figure out like who you really are and like what kind of person you are. You know, after the world's taken this all from you, you're going to find out, you know, who you really are. And then the second half of the movie just makes everybody the same person going after one exact, you know, one goal entirely instead of like being your own individual person Eh, not that interesting so let's blow up a credit card building about it so i think that's a feature and not a bug i think i've heard that before yeah yeah so i this so i guess to me the difference is what is the intention and what are you taking away from it so like two weeks ago we talked about falling down and we talked about how that movie is a rorschach test and you can watch it a lot of different ways and you can think different things are cool about it and here what's interesting is that the people who watch fight club the wrong way is not how you watched fight club because you're not like oh it's cool that brad pitt did xyz that's not where you're coming from and i do think that is an absolutely wrong interpretation of this movie where you're coming from is brad pitt tried xyz and it sucks and ed norton tried xyz and it sucks i was watching that movie through the angry young boy lens when i was 17 18 watching this movie over and over and over again on dvd i was totally watching it that way in a similar vein to when i watched falling down in that way when I was younger and couldn't empathize with Barbara Hershey's character. And then now, now I think that's much more interesting. But here where I think is what I think is interesting is I think Fincher never wanted me to watch it the way that I watched it when I was a kid. And I think what's going on is, and it's especially interesting now, because I think that Project Mayhem is just Proud Boys nonsense. And we're supposed to look at it as Proud Boys nonsense. And we're supposed to look at it as an inability to deal with latent homosexual feelings because these guys are just all over each other the whole movie. And all they want to do is hug and thrust. Yeah, bump up against each other. I think that's totally intentional. And we're supposed to see them as frustrated young guys who don't know how to deal with what they're feeling. And in their attempt to be an individual, they're just all falling into the same grifter nonsense. They're all just listening to Andrew Tate, the modern version of this. This is what manliness should be. By the way, now you all have to be exactly the same. And it's boring and it's stupid. And it's going to make you not pursue women anymore, which has somehow become a thing again in real life. Like none of these guys in this movie are pursuing women. Yeah. Ed Norton throughout the movie is like, I need to push away from the fact that I'm attracted to Marla. And then Brad Pitt, his 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 impulse is doing what he wants to do and seems hypocritical, but it's not hypocritical. That's just what he should be doing. Whereas everyone else is just in this weird incel monastic life. And I thought that was interesting. The things that we think look cool on the surface, like Brad Pitt's leather jackets and his differing haircuts and his peeing in the food at work. If you look at it for more than five seconds, that that guy sucks. Like that guy does. But I think we're. Oh, yeah. I I definitely think Fincher made it with that intent. And like the like I said, the people who are watching it and thinking he's cool they're they are wrong. And I don't think Fincher. I absolutely agree with you on his intent. So but that just doesn't work for you. No, it just didn't come through for me. Like, I just feel like, again, like that the first half of the movie didn't set the second half of the movie up to be that it just didn't like I've heard that interpretation of it. And I don't necessarily even think it's wrong. It just didn't. I don't know. It just didn't connect that way to me. I know it just didn't read that way to me. So I know you've read Cinema Speculation, right? The Tarantino book. No, I haven't yet. I only know what page this is on because I read it last night. Check out page 49 into like page 53 of Cinema Speculation. Mm -hmm. Tarantino talks about audience misdirects coming from Don Siegel. Um, So Dirty Harry and like I watched, I read this last night because I watched Charlie Varick last night. Charlie Varick is an awesome movie. Everyone should watch it. It's on Tubi right now. So Tarantino talks about audience misdirection uh, and that Don Siegel was a master at it and he probably did it best in Charlie Varick, but he did it his whole career. And I think that's really what Fincher is going for here. He's not holding your hand. He's really misdirecting you into thinking that the movie is going to be about one thing and then it is about another on purpose. And where I think that shows most in Fight Club is the scene where Brad Pitt and Ed Norton get on a bus and they see an ad of a tough guy, you know, looking good in the ad. And they say like, is that self-improvement? The line is something like self-improvement is masturbation. Self-destruction is the answer, which is just to your point, so far up one's <laughs> own ass. But I think that's where he's telling you, stop. This movie is not about that. You are yeah. now supposed to understand that this guy has been doing it wrong for the first half of the movie. And the rest of the movie is going to be about how his life him realizing that he has thrown away his life and started doing just the dumbest stuff, like thinking blowing up buildings is going to do anything to society. Like, I I don't think at all the movie tells you that by blowing up the credit card buildings, they've actually made a difference. Right. Yeah. So anyway, it's my number five. Mm -hmm. So, okay. We just, we disagree. We do. Um, What is your number 11? Uh, Alien 3, his debut feature. So Alien 3 is also my number 11. I've only ever watched the assembly cut of Alien 3. 
I didn't even want to bother with the theatrical cut. I thought if there are people who are part of the production who think they know better what Fincher's vision for this movie was and put together a version of that, that's what I'll watch. And honestly, I think it's pretty, pretty solid. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not not bad at all. It's not Alien or Aliens, but we talked about this on the, our Psycho episode, our Halloween episode. It's actually a pretty fun homage to Psycho for the first half of the movie. Yep. And from there, it falls apart. I think there's no way it could not fall apart. They just didn't film mm. stuff that would make it be super compelling towards the end. And it's um, very, I mean, the, the ending is Terminator 2, like literally. Uh-huh. Yep. Beat <laughs> for beat. And then the fact that it continues on after that, that there's a alien resurrection really just kicks the ending in the pants. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Solid action movie. I think it's all right. Yeah. It's very solid for a debut film for for which he obviously had very little control. I mean, yeah, it's, it's not bad at all. It's important because it shaped his uh, philosophy of filmmaking for the rest of his career. That movie came out in 1992 and we're now 30 years later and there are only 12 movies so he is only making films granted there's a break for television but he's only making films when he can have full creative control and that's happening because of alien 3 yep so that's also my number 11 what's your number 10 my number 10 is that's where curious case of benjamin button falls got it cool we already talked about it mine is the girl with the dragon tattoo okay yeah that um i like girl with the dragon tattoo but it's pretty close to there i have that as my number eight so this is a movie that he took from well first it was made as a trilogy sweden yep That's so the right. swedish book too yep. um or series of books uh, or well it's interesting so this guy wrote these books and they were published after his death he had a heart attack, I think. And then they were all published after his death. And then they made a Swedish trilogy. And then Fincher made what was supposed to be the beginning of an American series of films. And it didn't work out. That's not to say the movie's bad. The movie's great. Alicia Vikander is excellent as the eponymous girl with the dragon tattoo. It's Rooney Mara. Was Alicia Vikander ever involved? I think she did. The, there was a girl in the spider's web or something. She, that wasn't her either, though. Um, oh, then, then no. So no. No. I, I guess I'm just thinking of Ex Machina. Which is also a great movie. Okay, so Rooney Mara is great as the eponymous girl <laughs> with the dragon tattoo. Yep. Daniel Craig is solid as just a hot guy who's investigating stuff, okay. who's had a, a rough go of it. His career has been ruined because he went after a powerful guy and then got canceled in response. Nick and Christopher Plummer, Stellan Skarsgård. Yeah, you got a bunch of uh, Nazi adjacent actors being Nazi adjacent. <laughs> Um, very good. For me, this movie's very long. And I would say it takes its sweet ass time go getting going. Our two heroes don't meet each other until like almost two hours into the movie, it feels like. Is that right? Mm, it's not that long, but it's like because two hours like 45 movie, minutes or so. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's yeah, a while. It's, still, it's a while. And then they become like Batman and Robin pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some uh, absolutely insane sexual violence in this movie. So it's really not for everyone. Yeah. It's, even, it's uh, rougher in the Swedish one. Have you seen the Swedish? No, and I won't. Yeah, it's I remember seeing it. Uh, I was living in Omaha at the time and I volunteered at uh, they have like an art theater there that I uh, volunteered at at my days off from the, the mall movie theater that I worked at. So I'd go volunteer at this art theater They're like, yeah, we're opening the Swedish film called Girl with Dragon Tattoo. I'd never heard of the books. I'd never heard of it. Every shift I volunteered for, you'd get like a free movie ticket. So I saw just about everything that they brought in. So I had no idea what this was. And I saw some of the stuff and that movie like just blew my mind the first time I saw it. Because again, I had no expectation of anything. And the Swedish one's a little bit rougher than the American one, but it's it's pretty close i mean they do a it's a pretty comparable uh translation when i saw the how do i say this in a way that won't i don't have to put explicit language on our podcast <laughs> uh when i saw the silver implement being hammered i'm a 39 year old man and i could not believe what i was seeing i was like this was in a mainstream movie that's i can't believe it this played at the mall theaters so yeah like right you know in your local neighborhood multiplexes I had to look it up on Wikipedia to see what happened in the Swedish one. And I was like, wow, Wikipedia just saying that that's what happened. OK, I guess that's wow. Brutal. I didn't imagine it. That's crazy. And the mystery is interesting, but not that interesting. What's what's more interesting is just how the people play it out. Stellan Skarsgård essentially playing two different characters. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, he's got to be one of our most underrated actors, period. I think so. Yeah, he's just he's great in everything. Have you watched Andor? No, I haven't. He I've been really trying to finish Clone Wars before I go on to any other show because I'm like 10 years behind on Clone I was Wars. Say, so in five years, you'll watch Andor. <laughs> yeah. Once Disney Plus is gone, you'll have to find it. <laughs> anyway, he's amazing in Andor. He has some speeches in that show that will rock your worldview. I bet. And Craig is good as always. There are so many cardigans that Daniel Craig wears that I want from that film. 
<laughs> Good stuff. Not terribly surprised that it didn't translate into a full series here. It took them 10 years to make a sequel. And by that point, no one involved in this one was involved in the sequel. Right. Cool. So then what is your number? What My number nine is uh, Panic Room with Jodie Foster. Okay, so that's my number eight. So let's talk about it now. Good, solid movie. Really good thriller. Yeah, it's a Hitchcock movie, like all in, and it's a and it is a good one. We mentioned this on a previous episode too. I think Fight Club had dozens and dozens of locations, and Fincher hated having to work that hard, and so he wanted to make a movie in one location, and he did that with this, and it's very good. <laughs> one thing that I love about watching, I hadn't seen Panic Room in a long time. I remembered liking it, but I hadn't watched it in a very long time since between the first time I watched it and now. I've seen the show Carnival. So when Patrick Bacow shows up as Jodie Foster's ex-husband, I was like, holy crap, that's loads from Carnival. And it's so much fun when stuff like that happens. Mm-hmm. But yeah, everyone's great. Like across the board, everyone's great. This this is probably my favorite Forrest Whitaker performance. It's not his most showy, but I like him. Way, we were just talking about um, Stellan Skarsgård in the Star Wars universe. I don't like Forrest Whitaker in the Star Wars universe. Mm-hmm. I think that role stinks. And Last King of Scotland is very good, but he's big in that movie. And this is he's playing it real small here, which is very yeah. cool. And Dwight Yoakam is very scary. Yeah, and Dwight Yoakam is good in this. And Jared Leto's not obnoxious in it, which is a step up for him. So I would, yeah. In fact, it's it's funny. Uh, Fincher really knows how to use Leto and is obsessed with ruining Leto's face in every yeah. movie. <laughs> very funny. Um, but yeah, Leto's very good. And then Jodie Foster and Kristen Stewart are just terrific. Yep, very good together. Yeah, Kristen Stewart was only like twelve or something when this came out, but yeah, she's she's really good in this. Yeah, she's very young, and she. So it's interesting because this was originally supposed to be Nicole Kidman in the role. Oh, I can't remember if she got hurt or sick or what happened. Maybe hurt, but she ends up being the voice of the dude from Carnival's current wife on the phone. Oh. I don't think I I knew that or forgot it. I can't remember. I think, though, that Kristen Stewart was cast to play Nicole Kidman's daughter, and they would be very different from each other. Yeah. But then she's (laughs) Jodie Foster's daughter, and they're exactly the same. They have, like, the same haircuts and everything. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I think it worked. Yeah, it worked for me. Definitely bought them as mother and daughter. For sure. Uh, it's a fun movie. Um, so my my number nine is The Game. Okay. I have The Game a little bit higher at number six. Oh, wow. You really like the game. I really do like the game. And it's back to our our guy, Mr. Michael Douglas. I think Michael Douglas is the poster boy for Never Did It. He might be. Well, should we put him on the logo? (laughs) We we might have to. Uh, (laughs) And as we get into a few older movies, I want Kirk Douglas to also sort of slide into that. I mean, the Douglas family, we owe everything to the Douglas family. (laughs) Can't wait till we talk about Ace in the Hole. Yeah, uh, the game is really cool. I'm learning by watching more movies from this era that I am not a Sean Penn fan. Interesting. In general, I think he's just like hammy, but this is a Douglas movie primarily, and he's so great in it. Uh, It does bring up an interesting thing that we've talked about. I think we talked about this a bit when we talked about Heat. People like Deborah Kara Unger. What happens to these actresses? Yeah, she was in like every other movie for a couple of years, and then all just poof, she's gone. Yeah. So this is just a Hollywood being crappy thing? Probably. Yeah, I would think so. We know why he disappeared. James Reborn is also Reborn? 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 Yeah. Um, why, why did he disappear? Well, he's dead. He is? Yeah, he died. <sighs> First, John Turturro's not Jewish, and now James Reborn is dead. <laughs> what else are you going to spring on me? <laughs> this never did it lore of Jake finding things out way after the fact is my favorite thing. Man, sucks. <laughs> he's dead and- Well, she died life. in 2014. Yeah, man. <laughs> I wish I wish this was a video podcast so you could see his face right now. <laughs> so rest in peace, James Reborn. The really sad thing about that is so every starting in 2016, Jake and I started texting each other anytime a celebrity dies. <laughs> hashtag <laughs> and then the year 2016 was when we started. And we did it because 2016 being the Trump year, everyone complained that it was the year's fault that everything was happening. 2016 is the worst. And sadly, that's never stopped. So we do this now, even to this day. Yesterday, I said, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. Well, I just said Sandra Day O'Connor, hashtag 2023, because that that could go either way. When Kissinger died, we said, yay, 2023. (laughs) But yeah, it's sad that this he died before before this happened. Otherwise, you would have known. That's why you didn't know. Because that's why I did. Anyway, the game's fun. Uh, Sorry, we haven't talked about the movie, except that. Everyone and it's good. And the plotting's really interesting. And I like Douglas 
Well, I, I like Michael Douglas in this movie too. He's kind of like he's a little bit like of a Gordon Gecko, like a successful mm-hmm. businessman kind of type. But in in Wall Street, he kind of like he's one step ahead of everybody all the time. Whereas in the game, he's at least one or two steps behind. So it's kind of like a different twist on that uh, that uh, character that he's played before, and that's what made the game kind of really interesting for him uh, for for a Michael Douglas performance. Fun to watch him trying to figure it out where he doesn't know what the hell's going on. I feel two ways about that. One, he's kind of stupid. Yeah, right. He's he's kind <laughs> of a bimbo. He's a little bit out of it. You know, he does, he's not used to it's, it's just not his world. You know, he gets thrown into something he is, uh, you know, he's not used to. Right. But his world is very small, it turns out. He only allows himself a few things. I'm not the biggest fan of a movie where, well, I'll put it this way. In general, I'm not the biggest fan of a movie where you know what's happening before the character does. But what this movie does well, and look, I have it at number eight, but it's a four star movie for me. The movie was ahead of me. Like I didn't, I didn't really know what was going on until it, it happened. So I w- can't say I figured it out before he did. It's not like the Batman. The bad guy is the bad guy. The bad guy is the bad guy. No way. (laughs) The ending is a little bit like, oh, we're just we're just forgiving everybody after the suicide attempt. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But Um, okay. We'll go with it. Yeah. What's your number seven? My number seven is Gone Girl. Uh, Same. Yep. And it's good. I I really like Gone Girl. I think Affleck is great in it. Uh, I think Rosamund Pike is great in it. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris, not so much. I feel like maybe somebody else or anybody else could have been in the movie, but it's interesting. I, I liked him. I, I was like, yeah, I, I find him annoying and obnoxious and I don't <laughs> and I like I don't like him, but I, it's not because of the performance. I, I'm like, I don't like that guy. It was I think it was Carrie Coon's like first big movie. I think you're right. Yeah. And then she went on to be Proxima Midnight in Avengers Infinity War. Oh, yeah. I like the twists and turns. I love uh, Medea, Tyler Perry. I don't know. I'm trying to think, like, why don't I have it at more than four stars? It's a gripping, pulpy tale. And I don't know, maybe it does deserve to be a little bit higher up. I yeah, I have it at uh I have it at four stars. Yeah, I think it's yeah, really well done. And the score, I mean, Trent Reznor and Atticus Rossi are doing the score. I mean, the score is dyna- you know, is is dynamite and uh, uh it's one of Affleck's better performances. I mean, he's again kind of uh similar to the Michael Douglas in the game a little bit where he doesn't quite have everything figured out that's going on. He's a little bit behind uh for most of the movie, kind of up until he doesn't know at all what's going on ever. Right. That's what he's, I mean. He's behind. He's behind. He's way more behind than Michael Douglas. He's yeah. <laughs> he's at a complete loss. In fact, the he only has one scene where he ever gets the better of anyone when he goes on television and tells his his who he knows is alive wife what he knows she wants to hear yeah. and 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 turns the tape and then that is a huge plot point in the movie. But aside from that, he's a total dope. He's yep. an, <laughs> and he's a jerk and he's and he's bad at everything. He's kind of a butthole. Yeah. But he's really good at it. He's, he's, I mean, it's a really good Affleck performance. Yeah. Look, hot take. Affleck is good. Yeah. That's not a hot. I mean, I know I understand it's a hot take with others. Not a hot take with me. I think yeah. I don't know if it. I mean, if it is a hot take with others, they're they haven't seen enough Affleck. He is excellent. Uh, no. You know what? Watch The Last Duel and tell me Affleck's not a good actor. Yeah. Or Changing Lanes. Or for Never seen it. For a deep cut. Yeah. Yeah. Changing yeah. Lanes. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stand for it. All right, cool. I'll try that out. Never did it. So that's also my number seven. My number six. Oh, I don't think you're going to like this. My number six is the social network. Yeah, I can see that. My six was the games. We've already talked about that. You want to talk about social network? Let's talk about it. It's fine. No, it's good. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a good movie. It's Sorkin-y, Um, And you know, I bump up against that. Yep, um, I also feel like it's small. And I know that's what a lot of people like about it. But in 2023, when Facebook has so negatively affected society, And look, they couldn't tell the future. This movie came out a long time ago, but Facebook has so negatively affected society. So for this movie to be about the law, about who owns Facebook and who started it, I just didn't, this watch, I didn't find as interesting as when I watched it in the theater. I was really enamored of it when I saw it in the theater. And this time I thought Jesse Eisenberg is very good. I mean, he is, he's just a good actor and Andrew Garfield, very good. And Hey, Justin Timberlake, you threw together a few good performances in your acting career. Alicia Vikander, no, uh, Rooney Mara <laughs> is good in her two scenes, except that is to say the scene I hated the most is the scene that a lot of people like the best. It's that opening scene where they break up. I find that so grating the way that he talks and then she talks and then he's two sentences ahead. And I know that that's the point and I hate the point. I just don't like that scene at all. Yeah. I like the rest of the movie more than that scene also. Um uh, yeah, I think there's a lot. A lot of, I like the movie a lot more than you do, but I'm, I'm still going to agree with that that scene's probably my least favorite or you know most obnoxious 
uh, and not in the way they intended type of yeah. way. It's like show off to me. Yeah. It's, it's like very uh, active, you know, like let's do some acting now or let's, you know, yeah, it's very, yeah. Yeah. It's like vroom, vroom, let's go yeah, fast. Agree. But it is a good movie. Uh, it's just, I don't like it as, I, I just, I hear people saying it's the best movie of the decade and I just don't agree with that at all. I don't know if I'd go so far as best movie of the decade. Uh, I have a, it's probably my best movie of 2010. Although there was a lot of really good movies in 2010. So my list could be, flu- you know, could fluctuate, but I think I'd have it probably at my, my best of 2010. Well, now I have to look up what my best of 2010 is. <laughs> and my best of 2010 is Toy Story 3. And then Taika Waititi's Boy. And then True Grit. And then Denis Villeneuve's On Sandy. And then Shutter Island. And then Submarine. And then Black Swan. And then 127 Hours. And wow. then Inception. And then The Social Network at number 10. Those are all really good movies you have ahead of it. So, I mean, I, I mean, like I said, I would still have it as my number one. But those those movies you have above it are all very good. Except for the ones I haven't seen. Like, I haven't seen Boy. Uh, but I'm pretty sure you picked that for me. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about it. And Winter's Bone. Is also love Winter's there. Bone. Yeah, Winter's Bone is, is great. Um, okay. I actually like some people talk like the, the smallness of it. I mean, yeah, I I, I think it's I, I like the smallness of it, but I also like that it's a small thing that turned into a very, very big thing. Um, but the movie doesn't show it becoming a big thing. But even by the time the movie came out in 2010, Facebook had become this this very, very big thing that did start out as a very, very small thing. For me, that I thought that was very, very cool. And I like that it didn't like, yeah, it was about Facebook, but like I just kind of liked just the invention aspect of it. Like they were inventing something that was going to be used by a lot of people, you know, and like and just kind of what goes into that, like the creation of it and then like the business side of it and what it can do to friendships and what it can do you, you know like just all the ins and outs and things that go along with that and like I said the performances are terrific I mean Eisenberg is really really good in it you know Timberlake is good in his you know kind of small part I really like Andrew Garfield in it yeah and once you get kind of past that opening scene there's some good uh, I, I like the dialogue a lot better once you get past that again the score is awesome that was I think the first time Reznor had worked with with Fincher on, on doing the score which I think yeah the score is great I, I love it I still think it's, it's great um, agree though that yeah watching in 2020 you're like oh, Facebook, you know, Facebook is, has been, yeah, just so detrimental in so many ways, but you know, it's still something worth telling the story about because it has been such a big fixture in, you know, the popular culture and, you know, it's, it's such a huge thing. I mean, if anyone's going to tell the story, let's have it be David Fincher. Sure. Sure. I don't think anyone else could have done it better. I just don't think that this particular story is that interesting. And look, a lot of it's just me bumping up against a Sorkin script. Mm-hmm. So my number five was Fight Club. What was your number five? My number five is Mank. So Mank's my number four. So we're in we're in the same area. You were really mad that I put Mank above Social Network when you saw my list. <laughs> well, that sounds like something I would say. I love Mank. I love Mank so much. Mm. I don't get why this movie has like no reputation. If you look on Letterboxd, fewer people have seen Mank than have seen any other David Fincher movie. Really? Yeah, to me, it's really surprising because it came out on Netflix during a time when we all had to be inside. So 86 fans. That's all? Well, that can't be right. What's a fan? Someone who hits the heart button? Yeah. That can't be right. But anyway, but it has been logged fewer times than any other Fincher movie, including The Killer, which has only been out for like a month. Sorry, this is probably amongst my friends. I'm sorry. Okay, great. So I don't get that because this movie is great. It's something completely different from him. It's the other half of the Benjamin Button coin where his dad wrote this movie and he made it after his father died. And he made it in such an interesting way. It's about how Mankiewicz was writing Citizen Kane and then like the process of that and dealing with Orson Welles and then also the gubernatorial election of whatever year that was and how Hollywood was running the country into the dirt and uh, being part of that Hearst, uh, Louis B. Mayer social scene. I thought the, both of those storylines were super interesting. And the way he, sh- so it's shot in black and white. It used post production ADR for the voices, which is cool because it's meant to be a 1940s film. That's what, yeah. And uh, the sound, I remember as we were watching it, I just kept geeking out over the sound. And I think it's the first movie we we're watching at home. I was like, I cannot get over what they did with the sound. And- yeah, it's very cool. It's very well made. I mean, it lo- the set, you know, decoration, you know, going back to the way this, the Hollywood studios were operating at the time. I mean, you can tell he's this is a very thoroughly uh, researched and well designed movie. I think it maybe the reason why it's lesser seen is, you know, have, having I, I watched it with my wife. I remember when it came out and it was it, it just felt maybe that it was a little bit too niche for it to be appealing like. Well, you know, like my wife should be like, all right, you know, maybe I'll watch Citizen Kane, but do I really want to watch a movie about the guy who wrote Citizen Kane? Like, yes. I mean, I do. Of course I do. But I think that that might be limiting somewhat to its appeal. I guess what I don't understand is that 
David Fincher fans tend to be big movie dorks. Yeah. And I would think that big movie dorks would be really into a movie about the making of Citizen Kane. But beyond that, it's just it's also just about Mankiewicz's life. And he was crazy by the looks of it. <laughs> and Gary Oldman. I love Gary Oldman playing a 42-year-old person. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's the only thing that's really on. <laughs> I wish he had never said his age in the movie. Yeah. I think it deserves to be this high on the list. I'm glad you have it at least close to where I have it. I do. I do. That was your number. What's your number four? Uh, my number four. Wait, what was your five? Your five? My is... five was Fight Club. Oh, right. Yep. And then my four is The Killer. The Killer is my number two, but I'm happy to talk about it here. I got to see this in the theater and that ruled a lot. I had to watch it at home like a poor schlub. Uh, this movie's dope as hell. Dude spends the first 20 minutes of the movie talking about how good he is at killing and why, and then doesn't do any of that and botches, <laughs> or does all of that and still botches a killing. Does and it poorly. The, the yeah. movie is um, the people he has to kill to wrap that up after they come and uh, beat up his girlfriend. I've heard people be like, oh, it's such a small movie. It's so it's about like such a narrow thing. It must just be an experiment. And then uh, Griffin Newman said this was Fincher doing Soderbergh. And I think that nailed it. Yeah, I hadn't heard that yet, but that does kind of make sense. Yeah, and they're best friends. Fincher doing Soderbergh is great because we think about like, what is the girlfriend experience? What is Bubble? Like Bubble is a full movie. I would not call that. A, I mean, it is an experiment in that there's a lot of non-actors in it, but that's a full movie with a full story. And, and it's quite interesting. I actually think it's really underrated, but it is narrow compared to like Ocean's Eleven or The Informant or Sex, Lies and Videotape. That's all I have to say about that. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah, but Fassbender is great in it. I mean, it's a very insular. That's not maybe the word I'm looking for, but it's, it's I mean, he does a lot of self-contained. Narrative. Self-contained. There we go. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. And, and I, I loved the little bit too of like spotting which sitcom names he was using as his aliases. Like as soon as I figured out the use, I'm like, ah, Felix Unger. I know who that is. Uh, I think that was like the first one he'd used. Uh, and I knew right, right away what they were doing. It's like, oh, that's fun. I'm it's in such movie. a deep Walter Matthau pit right now that, that the fact that he used Oscar Madison and Felix Unger, I'm like, yeah, it's, that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and there was Sam Malone I saw was in there too. Yeah, he did a bunch. I've heard a lot of people say that they didn't find that funny, but my theater laughed at that. That My theater was laughing at everything. Yeah, Fassbender's awesome. Actually, speaking of Soderbergh, this was like a continuation of, like what if Fassbender's character, spoilers for Highwire, <laughs> that no one has seen and you really don't need to. Yeah. Except for this scene, this fight scene between Fassbender and Gina Carano in a hotel room is very good. What if Fassbender didn't die? He be- <laughs> he becomes this guy in The Killer. Yeah. <laughs> and there's yeah. the Smiths all over the soundtrack, which is great. I mean, who doesn't love the Smiths? And the fact that you have the narrator talking like, this is what I do, and this is what it is. And at every turn, none of it works. I just think <laughs> that that's so funny. <laughs> it is a very oddly humorous movie. Yeah. I was so satisfied by this top to bottom. It's my second favorite Fincher movie. Yeah. I mean, it's my number four, but I still, yeah, I really loved it. We're in four and a half star territory for me now. Yeah. I also gave this four and a half stars. What's your number three? My number three is the number seven. Oh, that's my number one. Oh, wow. Nice. Let's talk about how great it is. What I didn't realize before I rewatched it this time is that this is Morgan Freeman's movie, not Brad Pitt's movie. I'd always I think people forget that. Yeah. Yeah. What a chilling tale of loss of faith in humanity and society. It takes place in probably the worst city ever portrayed on film until Bo is Afraid. Uh, What a drag and what a great drag. I mean, just so beautifully plotted, pretty scary. It's violent and disturbing without being disgusting for the most part. I mean, the city is disgusting. The sets are grimy, but you don't, you don't see this stuff happen to people at any point, you which see I the think aftermath is, a couple of times though, which is pretty, pretty yes, rough. But imagine this movie in the hands of like Eli Roth, where you see the crimes as they happen. Yeah. And then also in the hands of Eli Roth, it's probably a comedy, right? I, I, you know, in fact, I'd actually rather not imagine that. So no, okay. thank you. No, Great. thank you. Don't Pitt plays again. Fincher does this a lot. Pitt plays an idiot. He's in, in the, Ben Affleck, uh, Michael Douglas tradition. He plays a guy who does not know what's going on and thinks he knows way more than he does. And then you've got He Who Shall Not Be Named, Kevin Spacey, who I just named, making his career. I think this and Usual Suspects came out like one right after the other, didn't they? Yeah, it was. I think it was like almost back to back. Yeah. Yeah. So boom, boom. The scariest man in the world. Turns out there's a bit of reality to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and he was uncredited um, in this too. So it was a surprise when he showed up. That was at his insistence. Got to give him some credit. I mean, that's a good idea. Great idea. And Gwyneth Paltrow, a really sensitive performance as someone who you do end up caring a lot about what happens to her. And holy crap, does something yeah. happen? She and Morgan Freeman have that, have those have a couple of really nice scenes together where, yeah, you really start to, to, to feel for her and 
and care about her and because and, and you, you can tell he does what do you say about morgan freeman that hasn't been said he's he's a treasure this is my favorite morgan freeman i think it might be his best actually i i think he should have had an academy award nomination here and he did not get one and that's upsetting yeah, it was this or the bucket list. Why? Why? Why are we limiting it? <laughs> uh, let's 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 not. All right, so your number two is what is Zodiac? What's your number one? Social Network. Okay, so if your number one is Social Network, yep. and my number one is Seven, that just leaves my number three and your number two, which is Zodiac. Yes, which is. Uh, huh. yeah. What can we say about this that hasn't been said by a hundred people? Uh, yeah, I mean, people have probably already said all these things, but I rewatched it actually recently because I had recently purchased the director's cut, which is only like, I don't know, five minutes longer. And I couldn't really tell what was all all that different about it. But I mean, every time I've watched this movie, I've, I've loved it probably a little bit more. I mean, there's just the three main performances in this are so good. It, uh, Gyllenhaal is, is amazing in it. There's when when he goes up and confronts uh, John Carroll Lynch at the end of that movie and they just look at each other. It's like it's it's one of the most like butthole clenching moments ever because you know nothing's like going to happen. Like, you know, this guy, he's not the kind of guy who's he's not going to kill Jake Gyllenhaal in the middle of the hardware store. Like, obviously, like nothing's going to happen. You know what I mean? But you still just like that moment of the two of them just looking at each other and they know, you know, 100 percent they knew who each other was and why, you know, and why each other was there at that moment. Moment. you know i knew that there's so, they're just so great in that robert downey jr is just uh, outstanding in this um mark ruffalo is great always i mean he's so good in this despite the studio apparently not wanting him that story came out recently uh where they basically said you know take our offer or take a hike but he's he's just perfect in this and their their interplay together is all is all really good uh chloe Seveny has a really interesting part in it plays jake gyllenhaal's wife uh and the passage of time is so interesting in this movie too because there's so much uh time goes past between certain events but the characters are still just sticking with it and they make things that should be mundane and boring seem like the most interesting things in the world so many cool little things happen like jake gyllenhaal is trying to solve this puzzle but then like some characters off screen solve it instead because that's how these things work and man i'm i'm gushing but yeah i love this movie that might be my number one i might have to switch my list so the gyllenhaal well it should be it's better than social network the, the, <laughs> Gyll- the gyllenhaal solving the puzzle and or after someone else solved it that's such a fincher thing to be like here's something i'm working on I'm working on just kidding here's something else entirely <laughs> A couple interesting things. One, I've heard a couple of takes on the same story about Ruffalo on set. Ruffalo, he did like a couple takes for some scene and Fincher cuts and he walks up to Ruffalo and Ruffalo's like, great, I'm about to get fired. They didn't even want me on this movie. He's going to fire me right now. And there were two takes on it. One was he was like really excited to get fired because he didn't want to do a million takes. And that's Fincher's (laughs) thing. And the other was, so he thinks he's going to get fired. He's stressing it. He's stressing it. Fincher comes up to him, pats him on the shoulder walks behind him and just moves one of the extras over a little bit <laughs> and goes, good job. And then, <laughs> so yeah, it's funny that, that I've heard that those two different versions of that story, both that Ruffalo wanted to get fired and then didn't, the other that he was afraid to get fired and it wasn't about him at all. That's awesome. We should also call out, you mentioned Chloe Sevigny does a great little performance. She's pretty much the only woman in this movie. I mean, what's her name? I own Sky from Say Anything is she has like one very scary scene where she and her baby get picked up. But really, like there's no there's like no women in this movie. Yeah. It's just a sea of great male character performances featuring and I'm going to list them all. Anthony Edwards is Mark Ruffalo's partner. Amazing. Brian Cox is a scummy TV host who makes himself the center of attention. Amazing. Charles Fleischer, who you may know as, I believe, the voice of the pinky in the brain. Oh. He plays a creepy guy who you has a scene with Jake Gyllenhaal in his basement that's so scary. Oh my gosh. That's, you talk about butthole clenchers. Yep. Philip Baker Hall, who is a never did it all timer because of the show The Loop and his many appearances in Paul Thomas Anderson movies. The best guest role on Seinfeld ever, Mr. Bookman. And his portrayal of Richard Nixon yes. in, a, in a Robert Altman movie. Uh, Elias Coteus taking a break from being Casey Jones in the Ninja Turtles as the counterpart to Donal Logue taking a break from all the- Being f- a vampire, yes. Being, a vampire. <laughs> being the fake Triple H before Triple H joined that franchise. <laughs> James LaGrosse is also really good as another one of the cops. And then, as you mentioned, John Carroll Lynch, who the only time he's been scarier than this is in the show Carnival, where he plays the henchman to Clancy Brown's arch villain, And he's just a real piece of crap. Recently watched- John Carroll Lynch direct a movie after John Carroll Lynch, no relation to David Lynch, but David Lynch is also in this movie. It's called Lucky. And it was either Harry Dean Stanton's final movie or one yep. of them. And, now I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. And funny, David Lynch was also in this movie. Didn't direct it at all or write it, but he starred mm-hmm. in it with, uh, and Ron Livingston also. Anyway, John Carroll Lynch directed one movie worth checking out. Not great, but good. Yeah, that's it. Terrific movie. 
you don't get a satisfying conclusion, but it does give you that scene with Jill and Hall and Lynch. That's intense. Yeah, it's enough. close as we're going to get. Cause they didn't, I mean, they never, they still unsolved. Is that right? Or did someone, yeah. they find, no, this, no, this no, that's, that's correct. Uh, the reason that you're confused, we talked about this in our memories of a murder podcast is this movie is very similar to memories of murder, but yeah, the South Korean killing spree was solved and this one was not. And those movies, this movie and Memories of Murder are quite similar. I think uh, Bong Joon-ho is called Zodiac, one of his favorite movies. Like you ever see those lists on Instagram where people like do their post their sight and sound list. I'm pretty sure Zodiac is on his list. As well, it should be. Zodiac's great. And I have it up at yeah. number three, but like my number one, two, and three, are, I wouldn't call them interchangeable, but this, The Killer, and uh, Seven, I just think are all just, they're just the tops. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I agree. I mean, I've got, yeah, Social Network, Zodiac 7, uh, those top three. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, again, not interchangeable necessarily, but I mean, can't go wrong. How many Oscars has David Fincher even been nominated for? He's kind of like an anti-Oscar sort of. Kind of as a director. I feel like just Benjamin too. Button got him a bunch of stuff. Yeah, Benjamin Button was his most successful film. I know that because that had 13 Oscar nominations, which yeah. is almost the most is 14 is the highest any movie's ever gotten. So 13 is a lot. And he was up for director for that one. Um, I know Girl with the Dragon Tattoo had a couple um, technical awards uh, nominations. Gone Girl had a, or no, just had one for Rosamund Pike just got nominated. Mank had a bunch was like, I think it was up for 10 and it won a couple. He was up for director again, didn't win. I know he was nominated. Um, seven, I think had one for like film editing, you know, some tech award. Zodiac didn't get anything, which is just, I don't want to talk about it. It was a big year. 2007 was a really good year. That's also true. I mean, that was the no country for old men. There will be blood year. So, I mean, yep. yeah, it's a, it was a tough year. And then Social Network was up for eight Oscars. I remember he again was up for best director, did not win that one, but he, um, Sorkin won for the screenplay and I'm pretty sure Trent Reznor won and Atticus Ross won for the score. So he's been nominated for director three times, but he has not won yet. Uh, one other thing I want to mention before we log off, if you want to be a Fincher completist, you have to watch Mindhunter and you should probably watch House of Cards, but he... So he's directed some TV and is responsible for those shows existing. You're also going to want to watch the at least the one episode of Love, Death, and Robots called Bad Traveling, which he directed. Love, Death, and Robots is like a sci-fi fantasy animation anthology series. I don't think Bad Traveling is very good. I have it just over Benjamin Button in my top Fincher rankings, whatever. But this does give me an opportunity to recommend two other episodes of Love, Death, and Robots called Jabaro and The Witness, I believe. Those are the ones that are directed by a guy named um, Alberto Mielgo. And they're just, you'll never see an animation like this. It's its unlike anything that I've ever seen. It blew my mind. So that's it for Never Did It for the week. Thank you for listening to our Fincher Rooney stuff. We'll be back next week with 1936. We're getting back to the year to year with 1936. If you want to know what is coming out next week, go to our Letterbox profile. You can find me at Brad Garoon on Letterbox. I think Jake, you're Jake Ziegler on Letterbox. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Jake underscore Ziegler. And both of us have pinned to our profiles, our Never Did It podcast list. You could also just search for the Never Did It podcast list. And the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list. We have a Facebook page now as well. You can check that out at uh, facebook.com slash Never Did It podcast. I'll be posting on that with uh, new episodes and uh, just fun updates from time to time about what we're watching and what's coming up. So check that out. And thank you for joining us for Never Did It.